George R. R. Martin had a problem after finishing A Storm of Swords. Many of his characters, notably the Starks, were too young for the stories he wanted for them. He came up with a solution, skip the story ahead five years. While this worked beautifully for characters like Bran and Arya, others reacted very poorly and he abandoned the idea. Other characters, it didn't work at all. I'm writing the Cersei chapters in King's Landing and saying, well, yeah, in five years, six different guys have served his hand. And there was this conspiracy four years ago, and then uh, this happened three years ago, and I'm presenting all of this in flashbacks. And that wasn't working. The alternative was that nothing happened in those five years, which seemed very anticlimactic. George R. R. Martin, 2013. As he says in that quote, does anyone believe Cersei could hold together King's Landing for five years, or that John would be Lord Commander of the Night's Watch without major incident in that time? It would be incredibly heavy on exposition, and you'd miss on seeing important character development. One of the plots that really goes off the rails is Brienne the Beauty Tarth. At the end of A Storm of Swords, Jaime Lannister entrusts Brienne with the Valyrian Steel Sword Oathkeeper, as well as a letter bearing the seal of newly crowned King Tom I, and one mission find Sansa Stark at any cost, and return her to her family. You say Sansa killed him? Why protect her? Because Joff was no more to me than a squirt of seed in Cersei's cunt, and because he deserved to die. I have made kings and unmade them. Sansa Stark is my last chance at honor. Jaime smiled thinly. Besides, Kingslayers should band together. Are you ever going to go? Her big hand wrapped tight around Oathkeeper. I will and I will find the girl and keep her safe, for her lady mother's sake, and for yours. She bowed stiffly, whirled, and went. A Storm of Swords, Jamie 9. However, this mission grinds against the five-year gap as Martin loses almost all of Brienne's knight-errant story that lets the reader see Westeros on the ground, rather than from a throne room or a solar. She bonds with Podrick Payne, learns to trust nimble Dick Crab, sees the harsh reality of war from Septim Maribald in his famous broken man speech, and of course, meets Dog the Dog. Her plotline in Feast and Dance is critical to showing readers just how devastated and savage Westeros has become from the warfare the fans cheered for. And also shows us what a true knight is. A primary goal of Martin's plot for Brienne was breaking down Brienne's noble heart and knightly valor with the harsh reality of war-torn Westeros. We see this most on display in a feast for crows at the inn at the crossroads. Biter's mouth tore free, full of blood and flesh. He spat, grinned, and sank his pointed teeth into her flesh again. This time he chewed and swallowed. He is eating me, she realized, but she had no strength left to fight him any longer. She felt as if she were floating above herself, watching the horror as if it were happening to some other woman, to some stupid girl who thought she was a knight. It will be finished soon, she thought to herself. Then it will not matter if he eats me. A Feast for Crows, Brienne 7. With this brutal end goal in mind for her character, we can see where George's problem with her plot arose. Where do you pick up her plot from? She's been given a narrow quest that she's supposed to fail at. Has she just been wandering for five years aimlessly in Westeros? How have Sansa or Arya showed back up in the public eye for five years? How did Brienne even finance this extended quest? Those questions proved difficult for her author, but he had a plan. Brienne is a formidable fighter, and there are sellsword companies like the Golden Company and the Second Sons in Essos. However, Brienne is a believer in duty and loyalty, and it's important that she feels strongly about who she serves. Serving a mercenary company would be very hard on her psyche, and if she did, it would have to be for a very strong reason. A convenient reason is revealed when Brienne suspects that Arya survived the quote-unquote hound slaughter at Selpans. Brienne wondered whether Willow might be more than she appeared. The girl was too young and too plain to be Sansa Stark, but she was of the right age to be the younger sister, and even Lady Catelyn had to say that Arya lacked her sister's beauty. Brown hair, brown eyes, skinny. Could it be? Arya Stark's hair was brown, she recalled, but Brienne was not sure of the color of her eyes. Brown and brown, was it? Could it be that she did not die at salt pans after all? A Feast for Crows, Brienne 7. Let's run through this scenario. Brienne hears that Arya was seen in salt pans, discovers a ship bound for Essos was there before the slaughter, she follows it to Essos. But Brienne has little money, no contacts, no knowledge of local culture or languages. Her only marketable skill is her size, strength, and prowess with the sword. Her best option would be joining a mercenary company and using her earned wages on following tips and leads. 
In that time, Brienne will become disillusioned, bitter, scarred mentally and physically from battles as she kills for causes she has no interest in, and likely hopeless as her searches come up empty. And wouldn't you know it, there is a character that fits that exact description. Maris, of the sellsword company The Windblown, debuting in A Feast for Crows. The two characters are strikingly similar physically as well. Brienne and Maris are the same height. That last gave Quentin pause. Pretty Maris frightened him. A Westerosi woman, but taller than he was. Just a thumb under six feet. A dance with dragons. The wind blown. Brienne is, well, well, she's over six feet tall, but not close to seven. No, 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 no. Just off the top of my head, I would say Brienne is taller than Renly and Jamie, and significantly heavier than either but nowhere near the size of Gregor Clegane, who is the true giant in the series. Shorter than Hodor and the Great John, maybe a bit shorter than the Hound, maybe roughly the same height as Robert. George R. R. Martin, 2001. They both have deep scars on their cheeks. When Dario brought them forward, she saw that one of them was a woman, big and blonde and all in male. Pretty Maris, her captain named her, though Pretty was the last thing Danny would have called her. She was six feet tall and earless, with a slit nose, deep scars in both cheeks, and the coldest eyes the queen had ever seen. A Dance with Dragons, Daenerys 7. Brienne's chest was burning and the storm was behind her eyes, blinding her. Bones ground against each other inside of her. Biter's mouth gaped open, impossibly wide. She saw his teeth, yellow and crooked, filed into points. When they closed on the soft meat of her cheeks, she hardly felt it. She could feel herself spiraling into the dark. I cannot die yet, she told herself. There is something I still need to do. A Feast for Crows, Brienne 7. Maris is rumored to have her breasts cut off or has very small ones. Brienne also has small breasts and has been threatened to have hers cut off. Maris is no man. Maris, sweet, undo your shirt. Show him. That will not be necessary, said Quentin. If the talk he had heard was true, beneath that shirt... Pretty Maris had only the scars left by the men who had cut her breasts off. A Dance with Dragons, the spurned suitor. The horsemen had surrounded them while their captain questioned Brienne, but in the end he'd let them continue on their way. Be wary, woman. The next men you meet may not be as honest as my lads. The hound had crossed the trident with a hundred outlaws, and it said they're raping every wench they come upon and cutting their teats off for trophies. A Feast for Crows, Brienne 3. He had to laugh at such fierceness. She's the hound with teats, he thought, or would be if she had any teats to speak of. Then protect me, wench, or free me to protect myself. A Storm of Swords, Jamie won. Both women are blonde and considered unattractive. It was not the first time Brienne had been mistaken for a man. She pulled off her great helm, letting her hair spill free. It was yellow, the color of dirty straw, and near as brittle, long and thin, it blew around her shoulders. I thank you, sir. A Feast for Crows, Brienne 1. When Dario brought them forward, she saw that one of them was a woman, big and blonde and all in male. Pretty Maris, her captain called her, though pretty was the last thing Danny would have called her. She was six feet tall and earless, with a slit nose, deep scars in both cheeks, and the coldest eyes the queen had ever seen. As for the rest, A Dance with Dragons, Daenerys 7. Six feet tall, imposing size, blonde, scarred across their cheeks, Westerosi, and either cut off or very small breasts. Those descriptions are a dead ringer for Brienne of Tarth and situations and threats she experienced in A Feast for Crows. Is Maris a time traveler like a certain fetus? A lost twin? A magical doppelganger? No, I propose that Maris is the abandoned future of Brienne's arc a casualty of the five-year gap that George couldn't bring himself to discard entirely. Maris also shares the same mocking kind of nickname about her appearance that Brienne has also endured. Daughter? Catelyn was horrified. Brienne the beauty they name her, though not to her face, lest they be called upon to defend those words with their bodies. A Clash of Kings, Catelyn 4. Pretty Maris frightened him. After 20 years amongst the free company, there was nothing pretty about her inside or out a dance with dragons the wind blown george couldn't make brienne's plot work smoothly in the five-year gap but he didn't want to let go of his broken brienne instead he renamed her maris changed her eye color 
and stuck her in his brand new sellsword company, The Windblown. Her existing at the same time as Brienne has led many readers before to wonder if they're the same person somehow, but inevitably someone mentions the time problem and it is shot down. Having Maris be an alternate timeline Brienne solves that issue. George never lets his stories go. In a conversation with Stephen King in 2016, he revealed that he still has his childhood notebooks where he made up alien species and had his pet turtles acting out violent court intrigues. His home in Santa Fe is littered with toys and collectibles he puts on display proudly. His nature as a collector got the better of him and made a compromise. It makes perfect sense with his style of mind that for thinking of a tragic and terrifying future for Brienne, that he would find a way of keeping it somewhere. A couple of minor changes is enough to mask their clear connection from readers. It's also important how George uses Maris. He has his broken version of the noble and pure-hearted Brienne come face to face with Quentin Martell. She's a walking symbol of how Quentin should turn back before it's too late. Planetos is no place for the Knights of Summer and heroes from stories. Nobody knows better than the world-worn Primaris. Her dreams shattered, body scarred, and eyes dead. Quentin should turn back. She has all the education he needs what happens to heroes in over their heads. Let's keep one thing in mind though. The five year gap is where Dance with Dragons was starting, not finishing. Brienne starts off the book as a broken character, a lost soul who has not given up on her ideals and hopes in the world. This is a classic breaking down of a character so they can be built back up like we see from Tyrion and Theon. Two characters that have hit the absolute rock bottoms of their arcs and barely recognizable from the early books. Reek claws his way back, one destroyed finger at a time of the being of Theon, and Tyrion comes up for air from the river of wine he tried drowning in. Brienne's original arc could have been much the same. She's been savage and disfigured like Theon, her quest a failure and reduced to serving a master she hates. George may have even had powerful moments in mind for her, like Theon re-emerging from Reek. I was Theon of House Greyjoy. I was ward of Eddard Stark, a friend and a brother to his children. Please! He fell to his knees. A sword, that's all I ask. Let me die as Theon, not as Reek. Tears trickled down his cheeks, impossibly warm. I was Ironborn, a son, a son of Pike, of the Highlands. A Dance with Dragons, a Ghost in Winterfell. It makes you wonder, what are their futures from the five-year gap that he repurposed into new characters? The Windblown is an interesting name for a sellsword company. It implies they change sides often, their allegiances fluttering like a banner in the wind. However, something as windblown could also reference a group of castaways in a storm blown far from their intended destination. Like, say, lost characters from George's other timeline. Pretty Maris is like the Rosetta Stone for the Sellsword Company. A guide for looking at these group of characters and puzzling out who they used to be five years ago. And that is what will be coming in my next theory video. Another member of the Windblown master who they really are, Kago, the corpse killer and captain of the Windblown.